says it's live. So welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. Um, it is <laughs> July 15th, um, 2015, and um, we are tonight looking at an article published in The Atlantic on July 4th, um, and a book that just came out, uh, from uh, the, the, it's excerpted from a book, um, called Between Me and the World, is that right? By Tanuhasi Coates, and um, I hope I got that pronunciation correct there. Some, uh, I say Tanahisi. Tanahisi? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, and um, so, also though, and he says in this article, and uh, um, that he's, it, it's written, it's a letter to my son. Um, the book is written as a letter to my son, and um, so we thought this might be a nice time to kind of figure out hypothesis together and talk together about the issues. The other um, moment in our lives that that's worth looking at, I think, is um, that we're about a year and two days a year from um, Eric Garner's uh, death, and then Mike Brown coming up soon after that, and the year we've had and trying to think about uh, what that means to us as teachers, um, as educators. Uh, so those are some of the issues and and I went to Chris Rogers and said those are some of the issues I want to talk about. He said well let's focus it on the article um, in the Atlantic and that's what we've done. And um, So let's do quick introductions if we can. Stephanie, do you want to start us off by introducing yourself? And then you have to unmute. <clears throat> Muted. There you go. Details, <laughs> details, details. I'm Stephanie Lewis. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a doc student at Georgia State University. Great. Sarah, welcome. Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name is Sarah Thomas, and I am a middle school English language arts and technology teacher from the DC metro area. Welcome. Kevin. Hi hey everyone, I'm Kevin Hodgson. I'm a sixth grade teacher out in Western Massachusetts and I'm part of the Western Massachusetts Writing Project as well. And way active on CL MOOC these days too, right? Everyone yes, uh, yep, the Making Learning Connected MOOC. Yep, cool. Jeremy, welcome. Uh, my name is Jeremy Dean. I'm the Director of Education at Hypothesis, a formerly Director of Education at, at Rap Genius, um, but taught high school for High school English for seven years, um, as well as college composition, and actually have a PhD in African American literature from the University of Texas. And you're back in Texas, are you not? Yep, I just or, moved or back. I'm on here. <laughs> I'm in an empty house with a one light. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations on that move. Thanks. And thanks for finding some time in, yeah. in your busy life here. And Chris. Hey everybody, uh, Chris Rogers out of Philly. Uh, well, born and raised in Chester, I should say, um, and now in Philly, uh, educator, um, media and technology, uh, teaching an English course, um, teaching a college course too, Paul, I'll tell you about later, and um, yeah, I do, I'm a, like a facilitator, as Kevin could tell you a lot, I do a lot of stuff with CL Book as well, and I moderate some of the discussions, so I'm there too, and look, oh, we got to do it. Perfect uh, timing, book. Dwayne. <laughs> We're just ready to have you introduce yourself, Dwayne. Hi. Hello. I'm Dwayne Dickens from Oklahoma State University. Writing project. Can, and and uh, can you mention what you did your studies in as well? My dissertation work was on persistence for African American males. Cool. Right. Um, and so, anyway, I, I'm so delighted that so many of us got on to the the, uh, the article um, through Hypothesis, and we can talk about some of the te technological stuff as we go here. But Chris, do you want to start us off? I mean, it was your idea to jump to this article, um, and well, what you were thinking, yeah. Well, yeah, I do have the. I have the book, um, and um, if it's my idea, um, the, the front of the book tells Tony Morrison, 
um, the greatest writer in the world, says this is required reading. So if anything, it's her idea, and I'm just listening to her. And uh, <laughs> um, the story, the the reason why I, I, it was posted on fourth on the fourth of July, um, I think it's timed perfectly, right? Um, and the I the really what drew me to this article is um, I, I got to see him speak, and I'm been watching his growth over a number of years, and what he's been asking us to do, and a lot of uh, a lot of his articles at the Atlantic, a lot of his writings, is that we have to reckon with history, and we have to fight and struggle to remember the trauma that our history um, leaves us with. If we're going to make it, if we're going to make it out of this, make it past this moment. It's something that we have to struggle with. Like um, it's just the American context. He's talking about over 400 years. So we have to talk about all those stories, all those tragedies, the ways in which policies have been set up and carved out over time to continue legacies of racism and white supremacy. Um, and we we have to deal with that. And I love the way that he packages into like a a sort of a, a conversation between a father and son. And he packs so much history into that. Um, relationship. So that's why I wanted to, I think I felt like it was a perfect opportunity to highlight that history and the way that he shared it. So I really wanted to, I've been sharing it with everybody, probably going to have like a little book session meetups in Philly really soon. So, yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else want to start off with sort of first impressions, first thoughts? I mean, I thought it was a really powerful written piece. Um, I had kind of heard about the book uh, through various um, reviews and other things, so I was kind of curious about it. So I was um, I was happy when Chris and uh, you, Paul, kind of sent along the link, uh, the excerpt there, and I uh, really kind of felt myself um, drawn in, I think, to the writing of it. I think the writing itself was very powerful. Obviously, the message is very powerful, too, but I think the rhetorical stance of kind of writing to his son... Um, I think he even wrote one of the notes that I felt like I was eavesdropping on a conversation that I felt kind of uncomfortable for the personal kind of way he was writing it. So it was kind of an intriguing kind of piece, and I assume the book just expands upon that more. Jump in, folks. Don't wait for me to invite you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, and just to add to that, like, rhetorical stance, right, I think um, sort of the... Um, when I when I think about why he chose to do that, right, and it's a discussion that that goes into sort of like classroom and teaching too, is that somehow when you go to just tell the story of American history, um, if you tell the truth, it's an attack, right? It's a totally an attack upon um, uh, people, specifically white people, who feel like you're attacking me by telling me the truth of whiteness in America. And it becomes a, a shutdown conversation. So I almost feel like his rhetorical stance is also a play on, like, I'm going to have a conversation with my son and let you into it. That way, the whole, like, attack and accusation part is sort of, like, mitigated. <clears throat> I found that interesting as well. I think it's a good point. I think that it, it, provides, a, it provides an entry point for the outside reader to kind of listen in, right? And it's also, I feel, you know, not that, not to be dismissive of history, but it's not just history. There's like this urgency to it that's familial and personal, and so, or it adds that to history. It adds a kind of weight to the history that's, uh, you know, it's not just a lesson. It's not a rant. It's, uh, you know, but uh, it's very, very powerful. And the the son is 15 years old, right? So, as a teacher of 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds, you know, I, uh, you know, it, it, I, you know, I'm wondering if he's addressing adolescence here too as well. Or, yeah. I'm not sure always, right? <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the curiosity of, of this form. It's, it's, sometimes it's really important that he's speaking to a son and at other times you're like, okay, yeah. He's uh, making important points here, but yeah. 
Dwayne, what was your first reaction to the piece? Or Well, I was wondering, in terms of him speaking to his son, how other parents would think uh, this related to them, and you know the sadness that he was feeling or expressing for his son, I was just imagining other groups of people, whether they were from minority groups or disenfranchised groups or the privileged groups, if they had a sadness that they were thinking as well that related to this history that either that everyone has inherited. And so no matter what what side of the history you're on, there is a sadness that I think every child needs to hear and recognize that they have a burden that they carry. And so I wondered how that sadness just sort of connected everyone. And so that that was really one of my first impressions as I was reading is the 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 shared sadness, but certainly looked at in a different way. Yeah, he doesn't run away from that sadness, right? I mean, that that was the kind of honesty that, that kind of surfaced for me is that he's pretty consistent through the piece of um, um, of, of trying to speak some kind of honest truths about the view of the world as it is and how how that reality is um, for so many people. And um, that it, I guess I'm thinking as a father and as a teacher that, like, uh, you know, do a lot to try to protect our kids too from the world, right? Um, but here he's really trying to be honest. Like this is this is the reality that you need to know about um, you, my son, but also you, the world too. Yeah. Well, I, I found it as I was listening or reading through the article. The the gamut of emotions. There was sadness, fear, anger, shame, and and just all of those emotions sort of uh, captured what is a is an everyday experience that many people respond to differently, but this kid, teenager, now has to really embrace it because it's it's his body. It's who he is. He can't run away from it, even if he tries to on the inside. So I think that was a, a more uh, a deeper thought is that even even if he wanted to escape that reality, others would still let. Oh man! We'll catch up. Uh, we 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 lost you at escape the reality. Are you back, Dwayne? I am back. Okay, we lost you. Even if you want to escape the reality. Well, even if you wanted to escape that reality of of this, all of those emotions coming together, the son can't escape it, the father can't escape it, his uncle can't escape it. So it's just a, a body of shame that that we all live with. Sarah, do you want to jump in or where? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, it really struck me when I was reading this article. I had a, a, a connection with it right away, especially when he started talking about Howard University and um, how he received kind of like a, a an awakening when he went to Howard. Because And I was going to mention when Dwayne was listing those emotions, those are certainly there, but in that section about Howard, there's pride and joy and there are other emotions in that section as well, right? Thing. Right. Yeah, but go ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I also went to Howard University, so I could really relate to what he was saying. Um, when I when I was a student in K twelve, then I received a totally different education than the one that I received at Howard, and I also felt like I was awakened mm -hmm. when I went to Howard University. Um, so I think that that as educators, and we kind of have a responsibility to show multiple perspectives. Um, in our classroom when we are retelling history um, and make sure that the voices of the voiceless are truly heard. Can we stay on that issue though? I mean, why, I mean, you must have thought about how your two educations were so different. 
and how can we bring some of that back to K-12? Right. We were just talking about this in the Voxer group um, earlier this week, mm -hmm. and a lot of times there's one way that the curriculum might say to approach a topic, or they might suggest leaving it out entirely. Um, now, as educators, uh, then then I feel that, that it's kind of our responsibility to uh, embrace an openness of dialogue and discussion in our classroom, the multiple perspectives that our students might bring to the table, and also giving different uh, different frameworks of reference, different different lenses through which we can we can uh, examine social issues and history. And uh, oh. I was just going to ask, because, uh, you know, one thing you said that stuck out of me is, uh, I mean, I wonder, are there curriculum places where they're saying you shouldn't teach this? Have you run across that at all? Or is that just uh, inferred in some of the ways that instruction and PD is kind of set forth for teachers? I'm just curious. I haven't run into anything personally telling me don't teach this. However, when you do look at the curriculum, then then you have, like, in front of you an explicit set of standards that they want you to hit. Um, so a lot of times that might be all that's presented in the classroom. So I think that, that as educators we just need to continue to, to think about ways to make the classroom a more inclusive. Hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, it occurs to me, you know, that, um, you know, this week, as Chris knows, and Paul, maybe, and Stephanie, too, that, you know, in the CL MOOC, we're talking about systems, and certainly a school system, an educational system is, is part of that idea, and, and how to how to kind of make sure that we can um, kind of make that system work for everyone, and so I'm just thinking of curriculum as part of that, right, and and what, what we're what we're shown to teach, uh, particularly as young teachers, right, um, that forms so much of your career <laughs> until you realize you can start breaking rules as, as long as you, you know, as long as it meets the needs of your students, but not every teacher does that, I know. Yeah, um, thanks, Kevin. Article that I always love pointing to, um, it's a, a rather old article uh, from 1971, written by David Lorenz, called um, English Ain't Relevant. And specifically talking at how um, the like curriculum, and specifically when you even listen to the stories that Tiny Musicota is, is telling us, is what what exact story is, is relevant, right, to be able to open up uh, like learning. And I, I got the book, and I'm only still in the beginning, but he has this one um, this one line where he says. I recall, I recall learning these laws, and you said about laws really of, of streets, of the streets, of street culture. I recall learning these laws clearer than I recall learning my colors and shapes because these laws were essential to the security of my body. And when I think about, like, what we're teaching in classrooms, I don't know if it hits home like that. I don't know if that we're set up in a system that is um, encouraging um, teachers to hit, to hit that close to home to engage feelings, to allow feelings to be expressed in the classroom, to allow emotions, to allow sort of like lived experience more than we really try to be safe and focus on more ab abstracting and um, I mean and that's one of the moments that we have right now, right? Of how do we bring in more active experiences into the classroom um, that allow for that? But traditionally I don't think that's been the focus or been the policy uh, or been in teacher education. Still a lot more work to do in teacher education about that. So one, one of my questions is, is when he's talking about the street culture that he was learning in, in, the, uh, in the excerpt that's in the Atlantic, um, was, you know, he said, he said a third of his brain <laughs> Was taken up in, in working through all of that, right? So I'm I'm imagining some of my students, you know, when they come into a classroom, they're still working through, um, you know, who's sitting where and who's doing what, and, and am I going to be safe here? And that's one thing schools could do is 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 try to make a safe place of refuge, um, I suppose, or at least recognize that 
that you know when they when this these young men and women come into your classroom, that's what's going on in their heads, right? They're, that's that's what they're doing, um, and I'm not sure what to do with that, but I think it's important to remember. Um, well, one thing one thing that it uh, lays out. Uh, may come as no surprise is that those, you know, if ta Coates is writing about those feelings of, his, of his, his own as a boy, uh, struggling with those feelings and ideas, um, and I think, you know, squarely that this essay that he wrote uh, is, you know, as I, I kept referencing in my annotations, it, to me resonated with Du Bois and obviously with Baldwin uh, in the epigraph and with the whole history of African-American rhetoric, Douglas, who also has a famous, you know, uh, rhetorical piece, uh, Tied to the Fourth of July, I mean, this is this is a, a landmark piece, I think, in African American literature, or will be. Um, and he's writing about those feelings. So those feelings are not just, you know, whatever one third of uh, a child's mind, but they are of uh, the same kind of uh, gravitas as these great works of, of literature and culture. Um, and so that kind of, that stuff that stuff in their minds is the stuff of. Of, of of this experience, it's super important to attend to and uh, and respect as you know high high culture in a sense uh, you know to be challenged and to be as to be struggled through, but really important, obviously. So let me bring up the uh, the the other kind of bigger issues that were are on began to be again they keep coming back to here on TTT and um, given the year um, reference to Eric Garner's passing, his, the killing of Eric Garner. Um, so what, what from this year should we be teaching? And is anybody saying don't teach that? Um, in other words, uh, you know, what are the, what's shifting in our own curriculum? Is there content that we should be teaching? Um, does it make sense to look at the different cases that happened over this last year? Um, how do we approach those issues? And, you know, that's, that's all mentioned in this article, too. You know, you, you've, you know, he says to his son, you've seen all this stuff this year. What's going on? And, and I'll say that when I bring it up to students, it's, it's kind of amazing you know how quickly they know the stories. They know what's going on. They've been tracking it. It's not like it's not known to them. Um, so it's a way to you know to be. So should we be talking about these stories? Should we be you know, having them investigate these cases? Looking at the New Jim Crow uh, stuff, you know, the yeah, tip, could, tolerance could, curriculum, you know, what, what curriculum, could, yeah. Yeah, I could talk about my approach and, sure. and how I'm looking to go about it. And I saw Joe post into the, uh, Joe Dillon post into one of the chats of, uh, about what it means for, like, embracing these narratives and stories in the classroom. And I think one, one of the, one, one, of, one of also the burdens, right, of, of of like a, a the killing of Eric Garner or the killing of Mike Brown, Mike Brown killing Renisha McBride uh, and sort of like the expanding you know in that unending list right mm -hmm. is that um, these things are sort of like the spectacular right this the spectacle moments the ones that are uh, that are spotlighted but these things happen every day mm -hmm. and there's continual policies in our school system in our housing in our um, uh, criminal justice system that will that are that these situations are inevitable right and in so many ways those um, will slow those slow tragedies are are missed and um, I was saying earlier today that um, you know MLK has this quote like injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere and I was just thinking about that like it's really not that far away when you think about it um, for most of our students. And I, you kind of talked about that. Um, and beginning to take a, take a look around, um, like right out, like even through the school and um, in, the, in the communities of how different policies, and I think Tanisha does a great job of doing this, um, 
Jeremy, I saw you post a link about housing policy um, and how, how, how these things lead to these events, right? And it's not so much about these um, resulting sort of like spectacles, <clears throat> but about the long histories and legacies that lead us into those moments. So when I, when I think about how to em embrace these stories, it's really about walking students through those steps. I remember when I was, um, and this is the last thing I'll say for passing off, is like when, um, when the Baltimore uprising happened. Um, this, this, so we had, the school wanted to stop and have us talk to the students and pause for a minute in homeroom. So I came down there and you know, the white teachers with their best intentions trying to lead this conversation. Um, <laughs> Like I, I was sitting with, with, with mainly white students, right? With with a, with a with a mix, with a mix. Yeah, mix okay. And I'm and I'm so I'm struggling in the back because I'm like I don't want to be the leader of this conversation. I want people to struggle and try to figure this out. But eventually, I, I took I took the helm and just drew out a timeline. And you look at the the, the timeline. If 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 the first African Americans um, in sort of like this documented history that we have get here in 1619. Um, six, as as in as enslaved Africans, 1619 all the way up to 1865. Later, a little bit later, depending on how you count it, is 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 uh, is the period of slavery, and it's full violence every day. Guns. It's um, the Fugitive Slave Act, which says they can kill you if you walk away. It's violence in itself, violence upon a body every day. So then you move into the next period between 1865. And in, in let's say 1965, when you have like Jim Crow, age of segregation, which is also enforced by violence, which is also enforced by police, which is also enforced by policies. So you have 350 years of violence, and then you take the next um, piece, and I just drew from like 65 to 2015, and I asked the, the kids, the sixth graders, what do you think is happening in this period? And one of the kids, like, he falls right into the trap, I guess you could say. He says, probably unknown violence. And I say unknown violence. We need to talk about that. If I was your teacher, we could probably do a whole year on just what unknown violence is, right? So I think it's a way to set that up. So that becomes a narrative, and that becomes a searching, that becomes inquiry. Like, what is what? What about the violence that we live in today is unknown, and why is it unknown, and what does that serve? But that's what does that mean? It's unknown. It's certainly not unknown to Coates, right? And um, he's letting his son know about it. So yeah. But yeah, this is this is the sixth grade. I work Sundown at. Sundown to to whites. Is that right? I'm I'm working at an independent school, um, mm -hmm. where a, a a lot of the community who goes to the school comes from like a a, a little ways away, uh, to get to get to the school. Uh, so for me, I'm I'm in North Philly. I see this every day. I see all this every day. But for people who are outside of that media circle, right, uh, or outside of that lived experience, they probably don't know. Right, and that's and I I don't let I don't think we should let ignorance be an excuse, but there's definitely an, an enlightening that has to happen, and in so many ways we avoid that in our daily classrooms by focusing on longer like these sort of more external experiences that are not connected to like the way we walk through the world every day. Dwayne, do you want to jump in? How do well, you? Yeah. Address uh, some of this in your class, but not only your classroom, other places too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as I was reading the article, one of the situations that I've been dealing with in Tulsa is, um, I imagine you've heard of the uh, the police officer, well, the reserve police officer who thought he had a taser, and he killed a man because he thought he was tasering him, but actually shot him. Yeah, it's a, again, it's amazing how like that's important for two weeks and then we forget. But yes, but go ahead. Oh well, yeah, it's yeah. still going on because you know the man's trial will probably be sometime next year. Mm -hmm. But for the students, this is an, an emotional issue that they are living through. It's not just history. To them, it's what do we do now because we have our children who live in this society and. It's really, it's a difficult conversation because I have some students who, who really, they don't want to know the negative. They just want everything to, uh, just don't dwell on the, 
the history and the violence and the shame. And then you have some who want to make it the only thing that they study. And as an advisor, as a, as a, uh, as a person who is concerned about student success, I want them to have that conversation, but I want them to find a pathway that honors where they want to go. Everyone doesn't want to take up the mantle and, and be the, the pacifist, be the leader in front of the crowd that's beaten down to make a point. As, as the article sort of mentions, that there are some people who in history we see this group of people who, who just who allowed their bodies to, to be the, the area where justice could actually emerge. Others would rather take justice and not sacrifice for justice. And so you have that conversation continually. And, and I don't want to say that one way is the only way. I do think that they, they converge and the students have to grapple with those issues and um, I think for me it's just bringing the issue to them and making it alive for them even more present than their next door neighbor making it clear that this could be you that's really or it could be someone who you care for so deeply and you don't want to lose that's what I spend a lot of time doing is making that conversation more real to them I, I would defer to the classroom teachers, but I, you know, one thing I imagine that I always remember from my, you know, experience in the classroom that I think is important here is, uh, first of all, I think if you bring Tanashi Coates into your class, you've already done a great service <laughs> uh, to your students by reading this essay. I mean, it's an excellent essay. There's all kinds of stuff in it. Um, he's a great writer. Kids should know about him. Um, his, his story is amazing uh, in, you know, the history of his life in journalism, you know, after Howard at the D.C. City Paper and then uh, later going to New York to pursue a career. Um, but I, I also think that one of the things that happens around these moments of spectacle, and I really like, uh, was it Chris that mentioned, you know, these are the spectacular moments, um, is that there's this battle for the narrative of these, of these spectacular moments. And I, I'd imagine that as a young person, as, as, as an adult, <laughs> as, as myself, it is hard to navigate the media landscape and the coverage and the, and the issues and who's talking about them and what they're saying. And, and finding the right voices that I'm able to, um, you know, sing in unison with or borrow from and, and, and create my own opinion. Um, and I, so I think, you know, the, one of the great services, I think Tanahashi Coates can be a go-to for this, but I think others, I think is, is finding the, the articles like Tanahashi's coverage uh, of different issues. You know, his essay on the Confederate flag is also really important, I think. Um, uh, finding these voices that can help students see the, the, you know, not the, the diversity of opinions, but the depth of the history. I think the depth of the history that uh, Tanahishi is bringing to, um, to you know, his experience, but also to all of the, the, the incidents, the spectacular incidents that have happened over the past year, uh, is deep. And I think if you're just watching CNN, you're not going to get that. Um, and so I think it's a great service to help find the narratives, the alternative narratives. You know, the, he talks in an article about the, the woman on the TV wants to show this picture of the black boy hugging the white cop. You know, there are certain narratives that are dominating coverage um, and that are dangerous. They don't uh, fully um, articulate what's going on, and I think teachers need to find those essays and bring them to class. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to piggyback of what, off of what you were just talking about, about how the media portrays different things. I think that now, in this day and age, um, social media has empowered a new generation of journalists. So we now have citizen journalists, and we now have citizens as part of the fourth estate. Um, so the fact that we have this going on, we're, we're able to see um, primary sources as they happen. Um, when when um, Michael Brown was killed, then that night there was there were no news outlets covering it um, except for one that I found very late at night. However, if you went on Twitter and you typed in the hashtag Ferguson and you had all of these resources available, you had all of these videos being taken from people who were live on this you know on the spot. So 
Um, definitely, I, I see what um, I see what Jeremy's typing right now, and um, <laughs> and and I would agree that uh, that now the power is literally in the hands of the citizens. So this is this is a new world, and this is definitely something to ponder. Yeah, and um, and we talk about sort of like finding voices that that we can trust. Uh, there's also about extending the dialogue. Um, one of some of the critiques I've, I have been noticing around Ta-Nehisi's book, right? And I think Stephanie, uh, one of the chat questions you uh, pointed to is like, is, is it uh, simply a white-black issue? Um, and I, I, I definitely think that's one of the focus that we need to focus on. But um, some of the critiques that I've, I've been really enjoying is also the, the gender, the, 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 the gender discussions that are that are happening here. We talk about so like masculinity uh, and femininity um, and how this in a, in a letter to his son you, you don't really get that that other picture of patriarchy um, um, heteropatriarchy that is also sort of like relevant in today's society. Um, so you know me Paul I always got like a book laying around and um, <laughs> the book I have is uh, one book I put it into the chat between good and ghetto and it's a, a ethnography of African American girls and inner city violence. It takes place in Philadelphia, and it's it, it's an exploration of how their how their lives are also structured by violence, right? And I think it's a, a perfect way to weave in a, a larger conversation that brings in um, not just this history uh, of, of of structural racism, but also a, a history. Of, of patriarchy and who gets to who gets to tell the story, right? Um, so, just something to add. Well, I do want to say that one of the things that that I really work with for the students is not only should they feel these issues, but normally when they come, they're wanting to make a difference, and so I have to try to give them the tools to come up with ideas or how they can act in a way that will make change. It's not just talking about it. They're, at this point, I find a lot of students who are just tired of talking. They're, they're tired of listening to other people's narratives. I have to figure out ways to help them create their narratives so that they tell the story and, and, not, and certainly not you know, knocking Twitter or Facebook or any of those mediums but they tend to be temporary mediums. Even though they, they happen immediately, they don't typically create that, that long-term history that the students need to contribute in order to be remembered and to be the change agents long-term. So I do try to come up with ways that they can go back into the community and they can not only, as, as this author mentioned, not only, well, I don't want them to escape totally from the community. I want them to escape from the potential loss of life. I do want them to survive, but I do want them to come back and share their narrative. And I want them to show this is how we can make it together. And so I really work with trying to help them craft a narrative, craft a plan that actually makes a positive change that they can call theirs and not just something, it's not just, and, and this writer really does do it well, he says, it's not just Michael Brown. This is just one individual, but it's really a, a bigger picture. So I need them to be able to understand that their narratives are much more significant than just the the one life that they have to live. They need to contribute to the broader narrative and make that change. I think this is where I was, where I struggle the most. Uh, living in the South now, um, the narrative is very much polarizing. But coming from Central California, which at one time was the breadbasket of the world, I was exposed to so many different cultures that were all marginalized in some way. You had the Hmong who grew strawberries because that's all they knew to do. You had the Koreans, the Vietnamese, the, um, 
and then on top of that, you had all the different Hispanics and the Mexicans who came in to work. And, so, and then you also had the leftovers from the Great Depression who happened to be white but were marginalized in, in the society there by, because they were the rednecks or you know, they were the Okies and they were the, the lesser class. So I think that whole narrative kind of depends sort of on where you are and it all needs to be discussed. I don't discount at all the need to discuss this particular narrative because I think it's critically important to our history. But I think we also need to be careful not to get so involved with this narrative that we forget there are people marginalized in different ways all over this country and that also needs to be brought to people's attention that, hey, you know what, we don't have it all together here and nobody has a monopoly on, on suffering. I, oh, is she still there? She'll be back, yeah. Okay. She, we, yeah, didn't, I, we didn't uh, stop her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I definitely hear you, Stephanie, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to step back from um, the, um, sing, the singularity of the legacy that, um, that makes up um, white and black, right? It's, it's a reason why it's set up that way. Um, and w when we talk about like, white supremacy, it's not, it, it's, it's not just, you're right, and it's not just blackness, right? But it's also the hierarchies, right? And part of that hierarchy is the, the creation of blackness in um, putting that at, at the bottom. Anti-black racism has its own uh, legacy. And yes, there are very much other other legacies of of oppression, um, and very different different means of how it how it does that. Um, but I also want to sort of embrace that if we can really engage in a a deep study of anti-black racism and anti-blackness that this country is in, the 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 lessons that we will learn to be able to um, sort of like transform how we live uh, will we'll not just be something just for black people but something for all people who are, who are, who are here. So I don't, I don't want to step back from um, saying that it's a, like an all lives matter uh, sort of, of, of approach because there, th there is specific things happening here too and we need to honor those. And I think that that's part of the, you know, critical to the story is that, you know, how do you explain and talk with kids about what's going on in Baltimore? How do you understand that event? And it is a very specific history. It has to do with the history of Baltimore, the history of the urban north, you know, going back all the way to, you know, the arrival of, of uh, Africans in this country. You know, like, and I think it's all connected, and, and ta does that, connecting all the stages of, of African-American and American history. I think there is something very particular about that. doesn't mean we don't teach other stories and other histories, but we're not going to just teach, um, you know, the internment of the Japanese uh, during uh, World War II as a stand-in for all types of suffering. We're going to look at different types of suffering, different struggles people had in history, and this one is particular. This one does have a specific history. Um, and knowing that history helps us understand what's going on on the news. So, so um, you know, I teach in a suburban community that's mostly white. Um, and so give me some help on how I kind of bring this into a sixth grade classroom in a way that, um, you know, it's meaningful for these kids who um, really have a fairly sheltered life um, there. But the kind of, um, yeah, my kids don't know any of that. Um, and the only thing they see is what they see on either the news or movies, right? I mean, that's their view of uh, black communities for the most part. So, you know, how, how, give me some help. Like, how do I bring this into my classroom? And I guess I'm speaking for myself, but probably for a lot of other teachers too, I assume. Yeah, Kevin. Um, I mean, as someone who, like, regularly engages in this conversation, that's a sentiment, even, like, at, even at school, right? I'm dealing with that. That question in in sub in subtle in in subtle ways is like so what do we do right and I always I always been of the thing that people are always looking for activities right and um, I think the the biggest the, the to me the biggest thing that we can do and it, what what I'm trying to impress upon like my colleagues at my school is that first you need to uh, take our take our own sales as our first project right 
and engage in a deep study ourselves. And once once we I think once once we once we stop once we stop trying to make the shortcuts around like how we live on a day to day basis, right? And those choices and decisions that we make, I think the rest of it becomes apparent. But I think mm -hmm. first we have to realize that there there are no shortcuts, right? There there's only uh, a, like as uh, one of the quotes says in the book, there's only a a, a, confront, a confrontation of these ghosts and myths. Right, and I think for me, the advice that I want to give is first, we engage in that. And I think once we do, though, even our conversations, our daily conversations, even our dialogues change that to become reflective of that. And um, so that that's what I have to say, is advice. And most people like usually walk away and say, "Well, that doesn't really give me something to do." Right? <laughs> well, I mean, it yeah. does because it centers on the idea of I'm just thinking as the writing teacher, right? I mean, right. constructing a supportive writing community where kids can write honestly about um, issues, um, either their personal narratives you're talking about, or their views of the world that then lead into discussions about, um, you know, uh, the world outside their their kind of um, very kind of insular community, um, and I'm just thinking. I mean, technology doesn't solve everything, but I'm thinking some projects in the past where we've connected with uh, other schools from different urban centers and rural centers, and our writing project, a big project, once connecting, kind of like Paul's uh, or the Youth Voices project, right? Where students are kind of learning from each other too, their stories, and I mean that's a really valuable step forward, I think, because they're connecting with real kids. Um, but who have very different experiences in their lives, and and how to make that kind of real in a in a learning moment, I think, is always a key. And I I do think it's really important to let kids or students enter the conversation in a way that it's it's this is who I am and not someone else. But they do need to be exposed to these other stories in a way that says. How is that other person's story like your story? Mm -hmm. They have to see that and say, well, how is it different? How is it the same? How are we all human? How are we all hurting? How are we all succeeding? How, what's the tie that allows us to see each other as the same and see that same hurting that if this if this person down the street in a different community is hurting, eventually I'm going to hurt as well. It's only a matter of time before that hurt visits my family in one way or the other. And so when they start to see that connection, they will be concerned about the, the neighbor down the street because they will see it as, you didn't understand that person but you will eventually not understand me because I will be different in some way, just like that person is different. I like that view of the world. <laughs> I would just add to that the need for uh, open, honest dialogue, and I, f I feel that everyone has kind of touched on that. Um, but one thing that we did um, when the verdict came down from the Ferguson trial was that uh, we had a mini lesson in my class for that particular day. We just stopped everything that we were doing and we, the students had time to explore. Um, they went through uh, and did kind of an analysis of information that was out there and before doing so we had a very frank discussion on bias um, and media bias and how different events might be portrayed. Um, so they kind of went through these different... Sarah, Sarah these students are, are African-American, white, or mixed, or what? Yes, uh, the composition of my school reflects that of my district, which is about 90% African-American, approximately. Okay. So um, in the end, what we did was that we had a collaborative blog um, where the students were able to voice their opinion in any way that they, that they chose. Um, and you know, the, we, we established the, the norm that, um, that everyone's opinion would be respected even if it was different than what everyone uh, thought. So we came together, we had a collaborative blog post and um, through that they kind of learned the power of their own voices um, and their own narratives as Dwayne was saying earlier. Um, 
so so that was that was a pretty powerful moment in class and um, they there was also some exposure to people who were uh, currently living in um, in that situation so through Vox or through social media um, then then we were able to get the perspective of someone who was actually living it and her reaction to it. Mm-hmm. So one, one of the perspectives that, that it's hard for me and given my upbringing and whatever, who, what I bring with me is Coates seems to be saying that it's, it's about the permanence of, of racism, right? And 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 the design of of violence um, against the <clears throat> black body, right? I mean, I, I'll at least say it, that's some of what starts. So so I'm thinking about Kevin's young people, or even my my um, my youth, uh, who are African American and Latino. Um, is this a perspective we want them to have? I mean, it seems to be a perspective that the Coates wants his son to have. Does he want 15-year-olds to feel like they're living in a country where there is, where racism will always be, and where, you know, they will always be in danger? Right. Um. <laughs> If, you're, or am I, or am I, if there was a question, yeah. I'm gonna say yes. Um, <laughs> it, it's, and it's not because it, it, it it's because it's a reality, right? And it's 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 a reality for folks. And we um, no matter no matter our stance, right? We are always we're implicated in a system which makes that an inevitable reality for a lot of people in our country. And to be able to recognize that leaves us with a burden of responsibility that sets up our, our lives in the way that says, are you going to um, transform? Are you going to, uh, how, how can we work together to transform this legacy? Or are we just going to ignore it and allow it to continue and fester? Um, so, yes, I think that we need, we, need, we need to make that plain. And we need to always... Be, be mindful of the systems of oppression that are at play. And, and I agree with Chris because I think the first order of business is survival. And, and not informing a, a child that there's systemic racism, systemic uh, inequity, whatever the inequity is, not informing them that this is your reality. Now you can rise above that reality periodically, but the the actual definition of it being systemic means that there will be times when even you, without realizing it, harm yourself and you fall prey to the heritage that says that you are inferior. And so you have to resist that by education, by remembering that you have something proud in your heritage and that you have to you have to fight to resist that. And others, you will have to help educate them as well. And you'll have to create partnerships, alliances that that help you and others rise above the systemic problem that we have. And I would even add, like one of one of the things that's all that's like subconsciously mentioned is that question is that we usually speak that legacy. Like he's having a conversation with his 15 year old black male son, right? Mm-hmm. But rarely, if ever, is that conversation had um, with a white male 15 year old, right? And how his actions and his life choices will contribute to the life chances. Of a fifteen-year-old black man, of his fifteen. Right. So that's that's what I, that's why I brought it up. I, that's why I thought of it with Kevin's kids in mind. Right? I mean, do those kids have to know this? Yes. Yes. <laughs> they better. I'm testing them next week. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's in that Pearson textbook. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, definitely because 
it's our world. I mean, it's their world. I mean, that's the world. And so, um, you know, everyone needs to understand um, that systematic thing because that's how hopefully we make changes to it, right? Um, and, you know, I have a 15-year-old boy, too, my own. And um, I can't say I had a conversation like that article. Um, <laughs> You know, we were actually not long after the Ferguson, um, we were in my car, and um, mm -hmm. Springsteen's song, 41 Shots, came on, and, like, we were silent in the car, kind of listening to it, and that music kind of, lyrics kind of sparked some, you know, discussion of our own about, you know, how people outside of our community here, um, you know, in different parts of the country have a very different life than he has, and he has to kind of keep that in mind and be part of the change that makes it better for them. You hope that you know resonates. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're getting close on time, so anybody want to jump in with a thought that you've been waiting to say? Please do. Stephanie, go ahead. <laughs> and j just to identify, we didn't cut you off, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> My computer froze, and I'm like, good, good, oh. yeah. okay, good. So, um, no, I in terms of how. It's absolutely mm. imperative that every parent have that conversation, not just with their sons, but with their daughters. Mm. And I know that my husband and I were really that we teach our children about the world we live in, the good, the bad, the ugly. And now that they're young adults, it's kind of neat to, go, to see them reaching out to everybody and just living this life that's so different than the one that I grew up with. So it's, it's kind of, you know, this slow, but it's not impossible. And I think the more of us who have these conversations, the better chance we have of changing that system over generations. Mm -hmm. I Sarah, just wanted to add one ahead, thing. Please, Jeremy, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to add one thing, which I think is, and this relates to the, the conversation that, that Dwayne and Chris were having uh, in response to your question about, you know, should we be teaching this if it's so horrible, uh, this history? And I agree, the answer is definitely yes. Um, but at the end, of, you know, the last line of the article is so powerful to talk about this beautiful and, uh, and terrible world, right? Um, and I think one thing that's, that's very poignant for me and, and makes me nostalgic for being in the classroom is that, what does Tanahashi Coates do uh, out of his life, out of his upbringing in West Baltimore? Like, what does he end up doing? He ends up becoming a writer. You know, he ends up writing these stories, and and that's his response to this uh, political, uh, systemic political racism. Um, and I think that that's really powerful for young people to 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 see as part of what can interact with um, the terror um, is a beautiful. <laughs> Uh, written word um, and can 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 write can write back to it, um, which I just think is, is pretty good poignant for talking about, uh, with writing teachers, but um, and students in writing classes. But mm -hmm. thanks. Um, and thank you for coming on here. We we did, I I thought we would talk more uh, about hypotheses, and uh, no. we still will, but. But please go to the article and uh, log into hypothesis and uh, and let's see what, let's continue. There are like what I can't even figure out how many seventy comments on there now. And so it's bring, a, bring your students. You know, tell yeah. your friends. Like, let's make this a place for conversation about about these issues. I mean, that's hypothesis is just a different way to have the conversation we had right now. I don't want to talk about the tool. It's just a means to an end, which is great. Great dialogue like this. Super. Dwayne, you have any last thoughts here tonight? I think that as the main message that I have in my mind is conversation is what tears down these barriers. It, it takes difference and connects us rather than takes difference to distinguish us. I think we just have to use that as a connecting opportunity. And that is what, uh, that's what I think I want our kids to get. That's what I want our educators to get, is that difference is not a reason to separate. Yeah, and thank you for reminding us about the power of personal narrative and, and, and that as 
a change agent bringing it back to the community. That's, I think that's part of what you brought here tonight, too. Great. Um, and Sarah, do you have any final thoughts? <laughs> Anybody um, else to jump in? Yeah, no, I mean, just piggybacking off of what Dwayne was just saying right now, then definitely uh, the power of connection is real, um, seriously. Um, and just a little understanding uh, goes a long way. So um, the more that we talk, the more that we get our um, our, our feelings, our, our opinions, uh, the, our lenses, you know, the more we can relate them to others, the better the world will become over time. And I, one, one, of, one of the thoughts I had when you were talking about dropping everything, right, um, when, when the Ferguson non-verdict came out, or non-indictment came out, um, I think that's when it was, yeah. Um, the, um, is whatever our curriculum is, it feels to me like when we drop everything, we're not really dropping anything. Right? <laughs> that it that it fits like we need to think about what is the. There are going to be other you know spectacles, so when these spectacles happen, how will how will that be understood with like within the curriculum that there's a background already happening that the spectacle makes sense, that it connects to a history that we're already looking at. I mean, that that's kind of the question I'm asking at this point. Yeah, that's that's a good question. And you know, mm -hmm. um, you, you raise a very, very good point. It's not dropping everything because what we did that day actually aligned with many of the um, of the Common Core state standards in the state. We looked at um, mm -hmm. arguments. We looked at, you know, using the Internet to, uh, to publish uh, opinions, which is like one of the one of the reading ones. So, I mean, there were, there yeah, were a list yeah. of about nine that, that we ended up hitting. So it's all about just making learning relevant and authentic. Cool. Amen. Chris, you get last word. Oh, oh man, you don't want to do that. <laughs> um, I mean, one thing I know um, is I think di dialogue, right, is, is important, but I always like to bring it back to actions. Are what mm -hmm. what really matter, and I I think sometimes we get we get lost in saying that hey we we talk to one another and uh, that connection, but I think really um, being being critical and, and vulnerable me first as an educator and the decisions and choices that I make and how that might have a profound impact on. Um, on, on the children around me and what, what messages does that send. Um, so when I, when I think about all these issues, I always like to foreground the personal uh, work and uh, how we're personally implicated uh, within the system and the decisions that we choose to make. Um, like, I, I, you know so many uh, like academics, right, who are fighting for public schools through their college publication but send their kids to private schools. You know, like dialogue, right? They, they talk about it, but what do you do? What do you do on a daily basis? Um, so I, I really challenge us to be real with ourselves there and be real with our fears about our actions uh, that, that, that motivate us to do those actions, even when we may hear the people of, uh, of another. So like really listen and put that into action. Cool. So that's all I got. And we want to hear more about your college course eventually. Um, oh, oh, yeah. So the college course, look, I'm just giving you a quick. The, okay. The college course starts with, if right? If anybody has to leave, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The college course, no, it's just one question. The college yeah. course starts with, what makes you deserving of safety? It makes you deserving of? What, what, what makes you deserving of safety? Wow. The college seniors. What about your life college makes seniors. you deserving of safety? So this should be fun. <laughs> 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 So just to say, um, we are here every Wednesday um, at Teacher Teaching Teachers uh, at this time. I'm talking to Jay G uh, Gillen, um, Gillen uh, from, from Baltimore. Um, he's, he's, he just got back from uh, a group that's looking at the Student Bill of Rights and teaching about the Student Bill of Rights in, in, when, when uh, there's test opt-out moments. Anyway, so that should be interesting. We're kind of cooking that show up as, as we're thinking. Um, and uh, we'll be returning to these issues as well. Thank you all. Um, 
the, we broadcast over the uh, network of uh, EdTech Talk, um, World Bridges Network that uh, Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier founded. Thank you all, and uh, good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.